We'll move on to the fourth statement about the blood, which is made in Romans chapter 5 and verse 9. Romans 5, 9. We'll read verse 8 to get the context. Romans 5, 8 and 9. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Take the middle phrase of Romans 5, 9. We are justified by the blood of Jesus. Now justified is one of those religious words that many people use and don't understand and which scare other people. But remember, wherever you read in the Bible the word just, you can substitute the word righteous. That's true in the Old Testament Hebrew and in the New Testament Greek. There is one word which the King James translators alternately translate righteous or just. When it's a matter of legal processes, they tend to use the word just. When it's a matter of practical living, they tend to use the word righteous. But remember, it's one and the same word. Now the problem is, with the use of the word justified, that uh, people have tended to reserve it for a kind of legal atmosphere a kind of a legal transaction. Well, somewhere up in the dusty courts of heaven, something happened and now it's all right. But you see, this is taking only half the meaning of the word. To be justified means to be made just or righteous. I always use the word righteous because it brings right down to where I live. My home, my business, my personal relationships. Just sounds as if it's just a legal formality that had to be transacted in some remote court somewhere and doesn't have much application to my living, but righteous immediately brings it down to the daily life. And the scripture says, and this is a perfectly legitimate and correct translation, we have been made righteous by the blood of Jesus. And I'll tell you, you aren't much justified if you haven't been made righteous. It's more than a legal ceremony, it's more than a change of label. It's a change of character and life and it's produced by the blood of Jesus I like this definition of justified which some of you have probably heard before what does it mean justified just as if I'd never sinned that's right why because I've been made righteous with a righteousness that is not my own but the righteousness of Jesus Christ look in Romans 3 for a moment verses 24 and 25 Romans 3, 24 and 25, being justified, made righteous freely, without deserving it. I'm glad the word freely is there. See, the problem with religious people is they're always trying to earn it. And they never arrive, and they're never satisfied, and they never relax, because they think they've got to do just a little bit more to get made righteous. Never will work. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath sent forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. We are justified through faith in the blood of Jesus. And I'd like to read on in chapter 4 of Romans 2. Chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Now to him that worketh, that's the religious person, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you always lived right and always done your duty, God owes it to you. See, God has to give it to you. It's a debt. But in actual fact, God doesn't owe anything to anybody. But, notice verse 5, to him that worketh not. What's the first thing you have to stop do? The first thing you have to do? Stop doing anything. Stop trying to make yourself righteous. Stop trying to be a little better. Call a halt to all that. To him that worketh not. What do you do? Just believe. Is it that simple? If it isn't that simple, you'll never make it. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. God makes unrighteous people righteous. That's what the scripture says, and I believe it. Turn also to 2 Corinthians 5.21 if you wish, or let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 5.21, just this one simple verse. The King James says, For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I like to change the order and put in a few names in places of pronouns. For God hath made Jesus, who knew no sin, 
to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. There is the complete exchange. Jesus was made sin with our sinfulness that we might be made righteous with his righteousness. This righteousness is available through faith in his blood. We are made righteous through faith in the blood. Now righteousness produces certain immediate, definite, observable results and I want to take just a few moments to point out some of them as stated in scripture because actually the whole of our living, our attitude, our relationships and the effectiveness of our Christian life and service will depend on how far we realize that we have been made righteous. Proverbs 28 1, the wicked flee when no man pursueth but the righteous are bold as a lion. There isn't very much boldness in most Christians today. They're timid, apologetic, tend to back down when confronted with evil or the devil. The real root cause is they have not appreciated the fact that they're righteous in God's sight, as righteous as Jesus Christ himself. When we appreciate that, it makes us bold. And then in Isaiah 32, we have other results of righteousness. Isaiah, the 32nd chapter, verse 17. The work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness, and assurance forever. There's three products of righteousness. Peace, quietness, and assurance. They all come from the realization that I've been made righteous with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It brings boldness, peace, quietness, and assurance. And then in Romans 14, 17, familiar scripture, the kingdom of God is not food and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. All these things are products of righteousness. If we don't receive the righteousness by faith, we'll struggle and try for all these other things and not achieve them. It's pathetic to see Christians trying to be joyful, trying to have peace, trying to relax, trying to be assured because somebody's told them they ought to but my experience is when they really get the assurance of sin's forgiveness and righteousness by faith they find it just happened joy flows naturally peace isn't an effort assurance is there boldness expresses itself the root problem is getting people to realize they've been made righteous with the righteousness of Jesus Christ justified just as if I'd never sinned. See, the majority of religious people actually think they're pretty holy if they go around pointing out how sinful they are. This is the general religious attitude. You'd be very conceited if you claimed to be righteous, but you're very religious if you keep speaking about your failures, your inconsistencies, and how many things you do wrong. I was brought up in a church where we had to do that. Every Sunday morning we had to do it. We have to say, pardon us miserable offenders. Well, I always felt a certain, what shall I say, I didn't feel I wanted to be a miserable offender. When I looked at the other offenders, I surely agreed they were miserable. <laughs> well, I eventually said to myself, if all religion can do is make me a miserable offender, I can be an offender without religion and not half so miserable. And that's what I eventually <laughs> came. But this was the language of religion. Pardon us miserable offenders. We have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have done those things which we ought not to have done and we have left undone those things which we ought to have done and there is no health in us. Well now, I could not say those words now. I'd be a hypocrite. First of all, I believe I have divine health in Jesus Christ. Secondly, how could I pray for victory over sin on Monday morning if I know that six days later on Sunday morning I've got to be saying that I've erred and strayed, I've done those things which I oughtn't have done and left undone those things which I ought to have done. See, I, it completely undermines the basis of my faith. And yet it sounds so good. And I know that some of the people that listen to this tape will be horrified when they hear Brother Prince say what he's just said. But I want to tell you, wherever you are and you listen to this tape, I mean every word of it. And I've been through it. Twenty years is enough. <laughs> All right, let's come to our testimony. What the Bible says. Not what some human institution teaches. Are you there with me? Section 4, my testimony. I'll read it first, then you read it after me. Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified, made righteous, just as if I'd never sinned. 
All right, join me the second time. Through the blood of Jesus, I am justified, made righteous, just as if I'd never sinned. We'll move on to the fifth, uh, which is sanctified. And we'll take two scriptures in Hebrews for the sanctifying power of the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 10.29, which speaks about the apostate, the person who turns back from the Christian faith, having known it, into a deliberate denial and rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it speaks about all the sacred things that he renounces and, in a sense, defiles. Of how much sore punishment, suppose he, shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite under the Spirit of grace. You notice there it speaks, in a sense, about treading underfoot the blood of Jesus. This is in relation to the Passover ceremony, where the blood was applied to the lintel and the doorpost, but not to the threshold. You are never to show disrespect for the blood of Jesus. But here is a person who has been sanctified by the blood of the new covenant and then turns back. We are not concerned this morning with the people that turn back, but the fact that we are sanctified by the blood of the covenant. And in Hebrews 13, 12, the same truth is brought out again. Wherefore Jesus also that he might sanctify the people with his own blood suffered without the gate. So the blood of Jesus sanctifies the believer. Now sanctify is another religious word that often causes problems. The word sanct or the sound sanct is directly related to the word saint which is another way of translating holy. So to sanctify means to make saintly or to make holy. And you just as well say made holy. To be sanctified is to be made holy and holiness includes within it always the thought of being set apart to God. The one who is sanctified is in an area where God has access to him but the devil does not. To be sanctified is to be removed from the area of Satan's visitation and reach and placed in an area where you're available to God but not at home when the devil calls. That's what it is to be sanctified. Set apart to God, made holy. And just like righteousness, it does not come by works, it does not come by efforts, it does not come by religion, it comes by faith in the blood of Jesus. Jesus, that he might sanctify the people with his blood, suffered without the gate. To be sanctified is to be set apart to God. You belong to God, you're under God's control, you're available to God, and anything that is not of God has no right of approach to you. It is kept away by the blood. In this connection, let me read you just one verse in Colossians. Colossians 1 and verse 13. Uh, beginning with verse 12 and speaking in the plural, in the first person, on behalf of all believers, Paul says, giving thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet or capable to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Notice the word saints, the holy ones. It's the inheritance of those that are made holy by faith in the blood of Jesus, who have delivered us from the power of darkness, the authority of darkness, the area of Satan's authority. And notice darkness has power. Satan has authority over the disobedient because of their disobedience. And hath translated us into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Notice, through faith in the blood of Jesus, we have been removed from the area of Satan's authority and translated into the kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ. Now the word translate uh, means to carry over from one place to another place and in the scriptures it's used of a total transfer. In the Old Testament, there were two men who were translated from, heaven to, from earth to heaven, Enoch and Elijah. And both of them went entire. All that Elijah ever left behind was his mantle, but his body went with him. And as I understand Scripture, this is the truth. We have been totally translated. We are going to be, we have been. Spirit, soul, and body, we are not in the devil's territory. We're not under the devil's laws. We're in the territory of the Son of God and we're under his laws. Now the devil's law is stated in Romans 8, the law of sin and death. 
And the law of God's kingdom is stated in Romans 8. It's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Maybe you would like to look at that verse for a moment because here are the two kingdoms with their opposing laws in operation. Romans 8, 2. Paul says, and he makes it his personal testimony, notice this. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. I am not in the devil's territory. I am not under the devil's law. His kingdom doesn't apply to me because I'm in another kingdom. I've been translated, carried over, spirit, soul, and body. That's what it means. And it's through the blood of Jesus. It's through being sanctified or set apart to God by the blood of Jesus. So we come to my testimony. Number five, through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, made holy, set apart to God. Perhaps you'd like to join me. We'll say it together once. Through the blood of Jesus, I am sanctified, made holy, set apart to God. Now I want to take this one step further in relation to the body of the believer. And let me say by experience I have learned that this is where it really begins to operate. It's when we bring it down to the realm of the physical body. And the testimony that I'm, I've given you there in section 6, which we'll go into in a moment, is the most powerful testimony that I have yet discovered for dealing with Satan and evil spirits. And I've learnt it by experience and I've seen how it works. Let's look first of all at what the scripture says about the body of the believer in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 19 and 20. What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Notice, bought with a price takes us back to the theme of redemption. Bought back out of the hand of the devil. With what price? The blood of Jesus. How much of us was bought back? Just our spirit? No. Our spirit and our body both belong to God because Jesus paid the total redemption price, price of his blood and it says we are to glorify God both in our body and in our spirit because both belong to God because both have been redeemed out of the hand of the devil by the blood of Jesus. Neither my spirit nor my soul nor my body are under the dominion or control of Satan. Let me say clearly I do not have a resurrection body I have a mortal body but that mortal body with every fiber, every cell and every tissue is God's property, not the devil's. And the devil, if he comes on that territory, is a trespasser. And if I understand my rights in Jesus, I can put up a sign and say, no trespassing, get out. Because legally, my body does not belong to the devil. It belongs to Jesus. And Jesus has a special purpose for my body to be the place of personal residence of the third person of the Godhead the Holy Spirit. That's why my body is sacred because it's the appointed dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. Scripture says clearly many times over God does not dwell in temples made with hands. Neither the first Baptist church nor the Episcopal church nor the Catholic church nor the Presbyterian church are the temples where God will dwell nor the synagogue. He dwells in a temple that was not made with hands. It was made by divine workmanship according to divine purpose. And that temple is the body of the believer redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians 6, 13, Paul says this. The latter part of that verse, the body is not for fornication. It's not for unclean, immoral purposes. And you'll notice just above it talks about food for the belly and the belly for food. Neither is it for fornication nor is it for gluttony. I was reading in the book of Proverbs the other day and it arrested me, the righteous eateth to the satisfying of his soul. The righteous does not overeat. This is a mark of righteousness. Why? Because my body is the Lord's temple and I'm not to defile it either by gluttony nor by drunkenness nor by immorality nor by any other misuse. The body is for the Lord and the Lord for the body. When I present my body to the Lord, then I have the rights of the Lord for my body. You see, if I purchase a property, I become responsible for its maintenance. 
If I live in a rented property, the landlord is responsible to maintain it. Now, if you just let Jesus have a kind of temporary right over your body, he doesn't accept responsibility for the maintenance. But if he owns it, he's responsible to maintain it. And that's the relationship that he desires. The body is for the Lord, the Lord for the body. My body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now let's come to this testimony. I'll read it the first time and then we can read it through together. Let me say before I read it, I have proved in experience this testimony is literally dynamite. People sometimes say to me in a deliverance service, Brother Prince, how do I know if I'm really free? Well, I say one thing to do is start testifying to the blood. Now this will not work unless the Holy Spirit is present. I'll show you why before we close this study. But if the power of the Spirit of God is in a meeting and people begin to testify to the blood, then I say anything that resists the blood is the devil. Go on till there's nothing more inside you that resists the devil and you can be pretty well assured you're clear. We overcome him by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony. Now this testimony I have proved in experience. It's when you get it down to your body that things are really going to start to happen. Some people's religion is so spiritual that it's altogether rather worldly. It just doesn't deliver any results here and now. All right, I'm going to say it. I feel good every time I say it. I feel better every time I say it than the time I felt before. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, redeemed, cleansed, sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, the devil has no place in me and no power over me. Now, you might find it a little fearful to say that. You think, well, if I say that, all hell is going to turn loose. Well, if it does, don't worry. That's a sure sign you've hurt the devil. Uh, just sit there and keep on to your testimony, and when the storm is cleared, you'll find you're in possession of the territory still. Uh, I can well remember when I first began to make this kind of testimony, I thought, well, I wonder where the devil will hit me next. And I know people that don't testify because they're afraid of what will happen when they do. But friend, that's just playing the devil's game. That's his way of keeping you from doing the thing that's going to put you outside his reach. It's only by the word of your testimony that you get the benefits of the blood. So you say it once and all hell breaks loose. All right, praise the Lord, say it again. The Bible says, hold fast the word of your confession. And then when everything really turns loose, it says, hold it fast without wavering, but keep on saying it. It doesn't depend on your feelings. It doesn't depend on situations or symptoms or circumstances. It's as true as the word of God. It's eternally true. Forever God's word is settled in heaven. Did I say it? I did. Now this time I'll give you the privilege of saying it with me. Why should I be selfish? Are you there with me? Near the bottom, section 6, my personal testimony. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, redeemed, cleansed, sanctified by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, the devil has no place in me and no power over me. Amen. Now, let me just point out in closing, I think we have just time to do this, that there's a relationship between the testimony of the word to the blood and the operation of the Holy Spirit. And you cannot leave the Holy Spirit out. But by testifying to the blood, you bring the Holy Spirit into operation. Let's turn to 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 for a moment. 1 John 5, 6, speaking about Jesus, this is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. Now, I do not have time to go into this, but I understand the water there to mean the Word of God. Jesus came as the great teacher, teaching the Word, sanctifying and cleansing by the washing of water by the Word. He came as the great Redeemer, shedding his blood as the redemptive price. These are the two main aspects of his redemptive ministry, redeeming by the blood, sanctifying and cleansing by the washing of water by the Word. He did not come by the Word only. He did not come as a teacher only. But he also came as the redemptive saviour to give his life a ransom for many. But this does not set aside 
his other ministry as the teacher. It says in Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, that he might sanctify and cleanse the church with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So we have the double ministry of Jesus by the water of the word and by the shed blood of redemption. Now, when we bring the word and the blood together, then it says the Spirit of God bears testimony because the Spirit is truth. So as you begin to use the word, stating what the word says, the blood does, the Spirit comes to you and bears testimony to the truth. All this is just religious language. It may be very good language, it may be doctrinally very correct, but it doesn't do anything till the Holy Spirit bears testimony. But when the Holy Spirit bears testimony, then it is irresistible. See, there are no little rules and regulations in the Christian life that if you do this, automatically it works. Nothing works without the Holy Spirit. But you can bring the Holy Spirit to work by testifying to the water and the blood the Spirit bears witness. Then you have three eternal, unchanging forces that work on your behalf. The Word, the blood, and the Spirit. Turn in closing to Ecclesiastes 4.12 and notice this little, shall I say, a parable, an application there. In Ecclesiastes 4.12, in fact, we don't really need to turn there because I've got the words in the outline. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. When you begin to testify to what the Word says, the blood does, the Spirit comes to you, and you have the threefold cord, the Word, the blood, and the Holy Spirit.